Okay, so this week we are shifting to nutrition. So that is the beginning of our nest, but we've already covered exercise and stress. And then next week we're going to move into social connections and sleep. So we'll cover both those topics next week. So let's talk a little bit about food. Um, in thinking about food as potentially medicine as well as nourishment for our bodies. So we won't talk about a lot of different diets because there's so many different diets out there. But I will cover two during our adventure into nutrition. The first one is a diet to avoid. This is the SAD diet or the standard American diet. So the standard American diet is high in refined carbohydrates. It's low in complex carbohydrates. It's typically low in fiber, low in fruits and vegetables, and high in unhealthy fats. And there's lots of processed and convenience foods, right? So this is really the diet that you want to avoid. So try to limit your consumption of our standard American diet or the SAD diet. So here's some of the reasons why you should avoid the SAD diet. In animal models, when mice are fed the SAD diet, they show elevated pro-inflammatory cytokines, which is an indicator for increased inflammation inside the body. They have decreased mineral bone density. So as you age, osteoporosis could become more of a problem. They have decreased lean body mass and increased fat mass within the body. So remember our lean body mass is our muscle. And we already learned in our exercise chapter that uh, exercise is important for maintaining muscle mass in the body. But as we age, we typically are losing this muscle mass, right? So we don't want our diet to increase that loss of lean body mass. These mice also had decreased ability to recover from injury and they had increased susceptibility to chronic pain. So there's weakening of the immune system based on this type of diet and because of the inflammation, uh, things like osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis have increased potential. So we know in humans, when we have elevated inflammatory markers, which are a hallmark of the SAD diet, that these are associated with things like dementia, Parkinson's disease, autism and epilepsy, Decreased movement and physical ability. This is largely due to uh, these chronic type of conditions like arthritis, both osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis. Asthma is heightened, heart disease, stroke, chronic kidney disease, breast cancer, polycystic ovary disease, inflammatory bowel disease, and a high glycemic load index. Right, And so this is talking more about uh, the things that increase insulin and increase blood sugar. So overall, inflammation is associated with a lot of detrimental processes. If we can decrease inflammatory processes within the body, we're going to also help maintain our health. So what exactly is the glycemic index? Because you'll hear that a lot. So I just want to define it for you. It's a scale that ranks food from 0 to 100 based on the ability of the food to affect blood sugar levels. So foods that have a low glycemic index have low effect on blood glucose levels, whereas foods with a high glycemic index have a higher impact on blood glucose levels. So you can see over here in our diagram, um, time is on the x-axis here and blood glucose levels on the y-axis. So after you eat a meal, if you eat things like potato chips or biscuits, cakes and ice creams, you can see that these are high glycemic index foods and they have a big effect on blood glucose levels um, within an hour after you've eaten. And you can see that then drops after two hours. So things with low glycemic index are associated with less obesity, heart disease, and diabetes. And you can see examples would include things like vegetables, lentils, and beans, pasta, whole grain breads, oats, 
oranges, these types of foods. So while we're talking about the glycemic index, right, diets that tend to be along the SAD diet um, are associated more with metabolic disease and the development of diabetes, which is caused by increased insulin resistance oftentimes. So when you have chronic high levels of insulin, this leads to poor blood glucose control. So you're at higher likelihood of developing diseases like diabetes, right? But this also can affect cognition as well because the brain is completely running on sugar. So the glucose needs to go to the brain uh, to mediate its function there. But if you have poor control over it, then you can have too much sugar going there. It may be hard to clear from the area and this can then become problematic. So they found that people that have chronic high insulin levels due to the, the increased sugar load inside their blood are at increased risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. And so this has been associated with the slower clearance of the amyloid beta protein which can form plaques within the brain. So it's also associated with increased tau protein in a hypophosphorylated state, which can lead to tangles inside of the neurons, right? So these are both hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease. And so there's just a little diagram up here showing what that would look like at the cellular level. So these amyloid plaques happen on the outside of the neurons and these are very rigid structures, so they don't allow clearance or flow and debris to be removed in between the um, axons and the dendrites of the neurons that are here. And then you can see the tau protein actually contributes to the formation of tangles inside the neuron itself, right? So these are both changes that happen in Alzheimer's disease. And this uh, will lead to the degradation of neurons and other brain cells within these regions. They just kind of get sick and then they die or atrophy. And so you can see a person that has severe Alzheimer's disease, you can see how much of their brain has been damaged and shrunken over the course of their disease progress. So anything we can do to reduce the potential or possibility of getting Alzheimer's disease as we age is beneficial to us in the long run. So our food choices can play a role in that. So one of those other diseases of aging, those four horsemen that we've been talking about is cancer. And so we can find that uh, some of our food choices can be cancer chemoprotective. So what does that mean? How do dietary anti-carcinogens work? How do we test for them and find out which foods have the most potential to help prevent cancers? So the, the work I'm going to talk about for this section actually has been done down at OSU. And two of the researchers involved in this work are Rod Dashwood and Mindy Mizak. They're part of the Linus Pauling Institute down there. So what they've done is they wanted to study some of the health benefits of cruciferous vegetables. And so they're shown over here, things like cabbage, cauliflower, and broccoli. And they contain uh, some of these interesting compounds like glucobrassicin and indole-3-carbinol. So you don't need to know the structures of these, but I'm a chemist, so I like structures and there they are. Um, and then you can see over here, there's another compound here called aflatoxin B1. Um, and aflatoxin, like its name implies, is a toxin. This one is produced by a fungi and it can actually be on some of our food molecules. So if our food gets moldy or it's stored improperly and it grows mold, if we still consume it, that mold can actually produce this uh, toxin called the aflatoxin. Once it gets into the body, it gets metabolically activated. So anytime we take in foreign compounds into the body, our bodies try to clear those compounds and remove them. And so they'll get chemically modified as we try to clear them and remove them from the body. In this case, it accidentally activates it. 
And so it's this epoxide three-membered ring up here that is so active. And so when this is present inside the body, um, inside cells actually, um, it can actually interact with DNA and it can physically modify the DNA. So here's the DNA portion, right? This is the guanine base and the aflatoxin actually physically forms a link with the guanine base and it puts this big aflatoxin blob onto the DNA molecule and then the DNA can no longer function correctly and you can get mutations that end up happening from this type of damage and those mutations are what cause the cells to start going haywire and start forming tumors and cancer inside the body. So aflatoxin B1 is a bad player. So this can form on molds that grow on corn. This can also form on molds that will grow on peanuts as well. And so you may hear of peanut butter that's been contaminated with aflatoxins as well. Those are two common food crops where you can see aflatoxins getting into the food chain. Okay, so what the researchers wanted to do is they wanted to see if eating the cruciferous vegetables, could they actually help prevent the formation of tumors, right? And so these researchers, they use trout as a model system. And so when trout are exposed to the aflatoxin B1 that we were talking about on the other slide, they will actually develop liver tumors. So this is their cancer model. And so what they did is that they pre-treated some of the trout with the indole 3 carbonyl, right? This is that compound that came from the cruciferous vegetables like broccoli and cabbage. And what they saw was that the trout were either protected from or had reduced levels of the aflatoxin B1 induced tumors. So even though they were still exposed to this toxin that can cause cancer, they actually did not develop the liver tumors. The indole 3 carbonyl was protective. So your veggies that you're eating, that your grandma always tells you to eat, are actually helping prevent the formation of tumors inside the body. They help provide protection. So here is another model system that these researchers also looked at. Uh, this one is a rodent model. And in this case, the rats are exposed to another compound called FIP. And this has a very long chemical name. It's called 2-amino-1-methyl-6-phenylimidazole-pyridine or FIP. <laughs> so FIP is much easier to say. But you can see the structure of the, that compound is here. And this is actually made from overcooking meat products in particular. So when you're seeing like burnt meat products from the grill, this especially happens when we're grilling foods. Um, things like chicken, this burnt chicken here, or burnt red meat. Uh, as well can form these aromatic molecules like FIP and these can actually cause colon tumors. So this is their model system then for the damage that can happen from burnt meat. And similar to what we saw with the aflatoxin, the FIP will actually come into the system and get modified as it gets processed to be removed from the, the system, right? We're trying to get rid of it after we've eaten it. And it can actually become activated as well. And it can also form these adducts or damage the DNA. So this picture here is a DNA molecule. You can see the double-stranded DNA snaking around here. And you can see this big red blob right in here. This is a DNA molecule that's been modified with this carcinogen, the FIP molecule, right? And you can see the formation of the tumor up in here. So this is a colon tumor that has been caused by mutations that have happened in the colon tissue due to these adducts that have formed by exposure to FIP. So this is that rat model. And what they found is that if they gave the rats green tea 
prior to exposing them to the uh, FIP compound that comes from the charred meat products, they did not develop the colon tumors. So in this case, the green tea is providing protection against the mutation of their DNA. That is pretty striking. So I guess if you're going to continue to eat burnt meat, if you eat burnt meat off of a grill, you should drink your green tea before you do that. So both green and black teas contain chemoprotective compounds. They've been able to study this further. And these are catechin compounds such as epicatechin, um, epigallocatechin, and some other modifications of these types of compounds. So each of these have chemoprotective effects. It's likely that it's not just to the FIP compound, but other compounds as well. So having a glass of green tea in the morning um, is a good idea. The green tea has more protective compounds than the black tea does, but the black tea also does contain these chemoprotective compounds, just not as in high concentration as the green tea. So in their study, they saw better protective effects with green tea. So from this section, overall, the take home message is that the foods that you eat can impact your health and susceptibility to the common diseases of aging, things like Alzheimer's disease and cancer. So fruits and vegetables, especially the cruciferous veggies, garlic, green tea, all of these are protective against cancer. So that is one take home message that you can think about as you're eating dinner tonight.